Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Bailey Henry. Um, if you hear music in the background, it is my son's sleeping music, so just try your best to tune it out. <laughs> it is uh, 8.45 on a Friday night, so uh, let's get into it. Um, I'm going to be talking about Art for a New Understanding, Native Perspectives, 1950s to now. Um, and obviously, when we're talking about uh, Native Americans, we're talking about some very heavy subject matter. Um, and one of the biggest, heaviest subject matters is genocide. Um, genocide is defined as a deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying the nation or ethnic groups. And unfortunately, we know several examples of this. Um, so first that comes to mind is the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, the Holocaust, and then the Jackson administration's Trail of Tears or his removal program. Um, but the Trail of Tears is only a portion of this removal program. Um, but the atrocities committed to the indigenous people of North America is massive. Um, the Jackson administration in this process had spread the notion and stereotype that all of the indigenous people of this country uh, were savage, volatile, dangerous, and they needed to be eradicated to keep the people, the settlers, safe and their families. Um, so they were placed in reservations that are probably the worst areas of land in our country with inhospitable uh, climates and not good uh, ground for growing or swampy, the worst places you could put a person to live. Um, they lacked clean water, all kinds of <laughs> glorious things. Um, the rest of the world believed Andrew Jackson and thought that he was going to put them in a place just separate and apart from everyone else. They had no idea that they were going to be put in these level of conditions. So it wasn't argued against. It's like, okay, they'll be somewhere, they'll be happy, we'll be over here, we'll be happy. That's that's not what that was. Um, and as time goes on, more is discovered about the obliteration of uh, the indigenous Americans. And there's only estimations of how many indigenous Americans died. Um, it's estimated somewhere around 8,000 Cherokees alone in the Jackson administration. That's just the Cherokees. There were so many tribes, different tribes in this country that were moved. Um, one that's smaller that I know of that's in this general region is the Kickapoo. The Kickapoo was uh, transferred over to Oklahoma. And I live in a place called Paducah, Kentucky, which is right at the very heart of a bunch of rivers, the Ohio River, Tennessee River, uh, Mississippi River. It is a very big industrial hub. Um, here in the Midwest and South. And so this was a very heavily populated indigenous area. And we have signs in several places over uh, the city that explains that we were a part of the Trail of Tears. Um, Andrew Jackson boasted that 46,000 indigenous people were removed from this land, and this does not include the casualties involved. So this is just 46,000 people that they know were put on reservations, not that passed away in the process or had disease or whatever. This was 46,000 people that landed on reservations. That's the flat number. Um, the treatment of the people in this situation the treatment of the indigenous people and how Jackson essentially eradicated um, the Native American was actually Hitler's inspiration behind the Holocaust. Um, his legislation was Hitler's blueprint for the eradication of Jews in uh, Germany and Austria. And as if this wasn't enough, we continue to mock them, belittle them, um, stereotype them until they started to really force our eyes open. Um, Art for a New Understanding Native Perspectives 1950s to now is part of that force. Um, indigenous identity has been constructed by a stereotype forced upon them by a white narrative since the first settlers arrived. And the loudest example of this is the Western film and television genre that is constantly perpetrating this idea of playing Indian. Um, so when you start getting into artistic exhibits that are confrontational as far as this is concerned, I feel like this is not loud enough. I feel like this is something that's not occurring or thought of enough. Um, 
mischief by Jean Quick, uh, Quick to see Smith challenges this identity by pushing in the opposite direction. Her piece demonstrates that while she and her fellow artists and native perspectives may practice indigenous tradition, it doesn't mean that they're kept inside this box. There's this idea that there's no life for them outside of the reservation. They've never experienced life outside of indigenous culture, which is completely untrue. Um, native perspectives also features another of uh, Quick to see Smith's pieces, which is called Trade, Gifts for Trading Land with the White People, and it specifically aims at that indigenous Native American Indian stereotype um, by featuring items that both objectify and appropriate their culture and represent the Native's relationship with the land that they've been removed from and how that has to feel. Um, but my favorite piece from this exhibition has to be uh, Dana Claxton's headdress. It's a photograph that features all of this beautiful beadwork um, that's kind of obvious that it's indigenous, you know. Um, it's immediately identifiable. Uh, the wearer of this headdress, though, her face is completely covered. You can't see her, she can't see you. Um, my takeaway from this piece is that Claxton's relationship with the traditional beadwork is showing a disconnect to the average American white person. It hides the person from the viewer and it hides the viewer from the person. There is no connection happening between these two people. So the wearer, an indigenous woman, is not seen as a person. She's seen as the stereotype. This separation includes modern and contemporary art, not just the identity, the, who these people are. The art world does not have much of anything to do with contemporary indigenous artists. And... Joan Scott in her uh, Multiculturalism and the Politics of Identity says, this testimony comes to stand for the experience of the whole group. The fact of belonging to an identity group is taken as an authority enough for one's speech, which I feel greatly applies to um, shows such as this, because while the artist is exhibiting their identity, they're also speaking about this group identity that we've been discussing. Um, so she's in this piece saying that we aren't just the scalping, howling, face painting Indians that you think that we are. I am not, and this is how I'm telling you that I'm not, and this is how I'm telling you my people are not this way anymore and never really truly have been as a whole. Um, Brian Young, who is a Navajo actor, um, used to take on these stereotypical roles because that's where the money was at the time for him. Um, he said in an article in Time Magazine, looking at myself in the mirror in full costume, I felt shameful for mocking my spirituality. I promised myself I'd never play Indian again, which is a really difficult thing to do in Hollywood still today because uh, one of the best examples of this is uh, Jay Silverheels who played Tonto in The Lone Ranger, the original Lone Ranger in the 50s and Jay Silverheels was a full-blooded Mohawk and he actually started um, what's called the Indian Actors Workshop in an attempt to f help a fellow indigenous actors break free from playing Indian but obviously with Brian Young who wrote this article for t uh, wrote this article in a uh, 2015 not much has changed obviously um, Native Perspectives is the first exhibition to chart the development of of contemporary indigenous art in the United States. So it's the first one to really show indigenous art as it progresses over time. And it's actually um, paving the way for other exhibitions, other shows, other museums to kind of follow in their footsteps. Um, a really great example of this is the Peabody Essex Museums um, on this ground being in belonging in America. And it challenges the concept of official history along with indigenous identity. And I think that it's absolutely fabulous. Um, my absolute favorite piece from that show, I have to talk about it because I feel it absolutely per plays into this idea of identity um, of indigenous peoples. Um, he had a piece, um, Alan Michelson had a piece called Town Destroyer, and it's the most debated piece of the Peabody Essex Museum's uh, exhibition because it challenges the official history and speaks to the pain and fury that is inherited within this identity group of Native Americans. Um, Alan Michelson's website describes his particular installation of Town Destroyer 
has um, an installation of video projected onto a bust of George Washington mounted onto a surveyor's, surveyor's tripod. During the Revolutionary War, Washington, known as Hodense, Hodenso A, <laughs> I, I'm butchering this, I know, uh, Six Nations, um, or Town Destroyer, ordered a brutal... campaign against them in which his generals devastated some 60 villages and hundreds of prosperous houses, farms, orchards, seizing livestock and goods. His armies burned the rest of the ground, destroying the food supply and forcing the people to flee as refugees, uh, forcing people to flee as refugees to Niagara to starve through the frigid lean winter in which many died. Through historic maps, documents, portraits, site markers, and other materials, the video traces the course of the campaign and the seizure of Haudenosaunee, that's how it is, <laughs> homelands in the aftermath. Um, with indigenous Americans, their history and their identity very much go hand in hand. It's very difficult to talk about one without talking about the other because it plays so much into their identity. And it is very much part of the concept of identity politics. Their history is part of what makes this identity group who it is. Um, and Linda Martin Alcoff in uh, Reconsidering Identity Politics explains identity as a casual explanation of our social locations in a world that is shaped by such locations by the way that they are distributed and hierarchi hierarchically organized. So essentially in reference to uh, indigenous people of this country, they're historically and systemically set up to maintain this stereotype and they're historically and systemically set up to fail. Um, I believe that one of the most successful portions of this exhibition is that it travels um, because it needs to be seen. It needs to be accessible. This information that is presented through these pieces needs to be accessible. Um, and that's one of the downfalls of the Peabody Essex Museum's um, exhibition is that it doesn't tour, but thankfully Town Destroyer uh, by Michelson does. Um, and this is also setting a precedence for indigenous art while it's traveling. It gives the viewers more of a nuanced understanding of the identity of Native Americans and what it means to be an indigenous artist. Um, and as a whole, playing against the stereotype of what indigenous art might be because most people, when they go to a museum and experience things that are made by indigenous people, you're thinking suede and <laughs> beadwork and feathers and drums and things of that nature. You're not thinking actual art paintings, photography, things that are outside of this stereotype that are incredibly important to these people. But the evidence of the atrocities still occurring to them are there to be seen. And even some of the most minor movements need to be made for their benefit. And now with more visibility, the exhibition will start making active changes against stereotypes because of the new understanding. And the challenges against official history are being taken much more seriously by a larger group of people. And it also commands attention and raises the demand for more modern indigenous art.